actually I forgot, it was my, my turn, you know, we start off this session with what I would call what our event, with what I would say is our dream session. We've been wanting to do this for a long, long time and eventually we managed to get both the gentlemen at the same time in the same place and also to have somebody like Shekhar Gupta to moderate this session for us is bonus. So I would like to invite Mr. Ratan Tata. And Mr. Narayana Murthy. And to conduct this historic session for Thai, no other than Shekhar Gupta. <clears throat> Thank you very much and good morning everybody. I hope uh, I am audible to all of you. Right there. Uh, I have, I am very fortunate because I have two panelists who need absolutely no introduction so I can get down to the job right away which is leaving the floor to them to talk. Uh, all of you know the theme, all of you know why we are here. We have some ideas of what we want to hear from them but uh, they may not have much idea of what I may want to ask them or to start this off. Uh, I'm going to ask them a few questions each one of them and maybe get them to ask each one the odd question and then we have time to move to the audience. So Mr. Narayan Murthy, if I may ask you, when was the first time you heard of a man called Ratan Tata and what did it mean to you? I think we have all heard about Ratan for quite some time when he came back from Cornell with a wonderful degree in architecture and uh, he spent time at Nelco. And when I heard that he was going to take over from JRD, I said, oh, it's so nice that the Tatas have continued their wonderful value system because we had all heard about Ratan's simplicity, Ratan's humility, Ratan's extraordinary focus on, on uh, achieving the objective. So my feeling was, frankly, was one of relief that the Tata legacy will continue because my wife is an extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily loyal to Tata's. And she felt relieved, and when she felt relieved, I also felt relieved. <laughs> the same question to you. When did you first hear of a man called Narayan Murthy, and what did that mean to you? Uh, the first time I heard of uh, Murti was in fact in connection with Infosys, the storybook uh, software company that, that had been built and uh, I, I can't remember when but then I finally met him and, and I was, uh, you know, there's a great reputation before I, before I did come to meet him, but when I did meet him, I had expected a, a rather, you know, obviously satisfied, perhaps a rather arrogant person. On the contrary, I met somebody who we instantly became friends. And the first time I, I remember actually spending time with him was when he invited me to the Infosys campus. Uh, and I think I've been someone that's joined his, the rank of admirers ever since. Did you invite him to TCS as well at some point? No, I haven't because we, with humility, don't have a campus that measures him and we don't have the space <laughs> to, to plant as many trees as he has from various dignitaries all over the world. When we do, I will. <laughs> but you are... Friends, you, you, but you, all, you also compete in the marketplace. 
Well, I think uh, this, in my opinion, is the way competition should be. I have tremendous respect for Tata's. I have tremendous respect for Ratan. And I think to be able to compete with his group is an honor to emphasize. And uh, we have so far conducted ourselves as worthy competitors to Ratan's TCS. You know, uh, when you look at contemporary history, there's always a debate about which is the most important year of our time, or which is the most awful year, or which is the most wonderful year. Uh, and the debate goes on and on and on, and people say 1987, somebody says 1998, somebody says 2001, because 9-11 happened. Uh, but let me tell you, there was one more year uh, in our times, which was a very significant year for India, and that year was 1981. Uh, that was the year Mr. Tata became chairman of his group. That was the year Infosys was launched. And do you, does anybody recollect where was Dr. Manmohan Singh then? He was member secretary of the planning commission. So from 81 to 2009, idea of India has got totally redefined. So Mr. Tata, if I may turn to you first, what has changed briefly and what needs to change? And are we heading in the right direction? Well, you know, I, I think uh, for someone like me, the, the greatest satisfaction has been to see India opening up as it has. And uh, the Indian consumer and the entrepreneur having a chance to, to flourish on merit uh, rather than on influence and, and hierarchy, which of course still unfortunately exists, but there is a much greater freedom and the consumer has an option to choose, which is important. I think we are, we are still unfortunately over controlling the economy. We still have very strong uh, vested interest groups who I think are uh, working against the, the true potential of India unfortunately many of them in the private sector and uh, and I, th I think enforcement of rules and policies are not what they should be on an equitable basis. The very fact that we have to hold this uh, in this makeshift hall shows there is a lot of work to do, isn't it? In the city of Bombay? Yes, I think that's, that's another example of the same, of the same thing. Mr. Murthy? They, they are saying that they are not able to hear we need yeah. Okay. I, I'm glad to hear that because I couldn't hear him myself. No, I, yeah. Sorry, what, what was your question? Uh, my question was that we've seen the idea of India redefined in, in this 20, almost three decades since 1981. What do you think has got fixed and what do you think needs fixing? And if you think we are headed in the right direction? Uh, we are clearly headed in the right direction. We have by and large removed licensing in most of the sectors of our industry. However, we still need to move forward in having a flexible labor policy, in uh, creating infrastructure, in liberalizing our education system because talent is extremely important. We need to look at uh, creating large infrastructure with, on a small footprint because our still the floor area ratios in most cities are way below other comparable cities that if you compare Mumbai or Bangalore or Calcutta or Delhi with Shanghai or New York or London, this floor area ratio is very, very small and that creates tremendous problems. So I think if we 
get to work on liberalizing education, if we get to work on flexible labor policy, if we get to work on our infrastructure, if we get to work on improving our supply chain, if we get to work on improving the efficiency of the state government, I do think that we will be able to progress much faster. Because uh, if I may say so, uh, the two biggest challenges uh, for India, if it has to go forward with entrepreneurship, is land and talent. Talent, human talent. Uh, we know, Mr. Tata, your problems with Didi, Mamta Banerjee. And we know the spat you had, Mr. Murthy, with Mr. Devagoda. Uh, over, and what did you have your spat over? Improving the airport in Bangalore or infrastructure. So my question to both of you now is, what is your understanding uh, of dealing with politicians and politics, and how has it evolved over the decade, if I may start with you first? Well, let me allude to this land issue. I have all along been saying that the floor area ratio has to be improved from the current 1.1 or 1.2 to something like 15. Today, when we recruit a software engineer, we need approximately 200 square feet of space, including the library, the research labs, the food courts, office space, etc. What that means is, given that our floor area ratio is only 1.1 or 1.2 in major cities, we can recruit only about 220 software engineers per acre. Last year, we recruited 25,000 engineers. What that means is we needed land of something approximately 110 acres, just the incremental new land. On the other hand, if the government were to sit down and then say, can we revise the floor, air ratio, floor area ratio to 1 is to 15, we would have required approximately about 7 to 8 acres. Then a lot of these discussions would not have been worth, would not have been necessary. Of course, the issue of, for example, Tata Steel or Tata Motors is slightly different. You can't build 15 floor there. The issue that is important there is most of the land that is allotted to industries, they are barren lands. They have not been cultivated. So, uh, uh, even the land that has been allotted to us, whatever little we have bought, is all barren land. It has not been, culti been cultivated for 50 years. I think that is the issue. Mr. Tata, the same question to you. Uh, how has your understanding of dealing with politicians or the political system evolved? And uh, have you had any surprises, pleasant or unpleasant? You know, I think the issue of land has become uh, a really hot issue, which is now going to impact most infrastructure projects, uh, most large projects in the country. Um, I don't want to sound trite or, or superficial, but more often than not, the conflicts that an industry faces on land are provoked more from individuals who appear who are in fact not from that landmass, but, but are there either politically inclined or exploitive. And I think somewhere along the line, as in most other countries, the leaders of our country will need to define and reconcile themselves to the need for a balance between uh, cultivated land and industrial land. Both have to grow, and agriculture has to be made more efficient for the footprint it occupies, and, and the same holds true for industries. Would you say, uh, <coughs> would you agree that land is the area that still remains the least reformed, even after two decades of reform in India? the use of land. Yes, but it is, that is also an issue in countries like Japan. So where there is a strong agricultural community, that becomes an issue. It has to be reconciled. Uh, and 
I think what one needs to do is to define that there is no uh, injustice done and that there is no uh, long-term detriment to the landowner. But there is also a political angle to it, uh, which, which is something both of you may have faced, because the big power that the politician now has, just the power of signing a piece of paper and changing land use. So land which is 10 lakhs rupees per acre can become worth 10 crores per acre. And none of that arbitrage is being transferred to the farmer. That's absolutely correct. And uh, that is an issue, certainly, that, that they justifiably see. And then, as Mr. Murthy says, the politician can decide whether you get 1.5 or 15. And there is arbitrage there also. Do you face requests sometimes? Do you face requests sometimes from politicians or suggestions that, look, I am doing so much for you, something can be done for me, everybody does it? No, I, I must uh, confess that... If you uh, stock options? No, I must, I must confess, I must admit that not a single politician has asked for any favor from us. That, I must say that. I, I, I credit them. I credit them with that. Mr. Tata, will you join in with that or? Yes, by, by and large that has been so. Uh, I think at, at various lower levels, politicians have, have sought gratification and for most part they know that we do not entertain that and so we certainly have not noticed this on any on any major scale and we have not given anything so it's it's uh, you know water on a duck's back if it were if it were requested we've lost some uh, right. benefit as a result of that well uh, I've had a theory for a long time that the last two things that Indian politician will allow to be reformed in this country are land and police because with the abolition of license quota Raj, it doesn't have many other avenues of making money, but land uh, is a 24-hour ATM with an unlimited supply of cash. Because as long as he has the power of change of land use and he has the power to decide how you and I can use that land after buying it, he makes money from it. And second is police, because you know it's just the brute uh, misuse of police that gives him the muscle power. So sometimes I find our political system resembles a mafia uh, which, which draws money from land and has a private army which is the police, isn't it? Is, is that the area of governance that needs to be reformed now? Sorry. Is that the area of governance that needs reform now? Yes, I think it is because I think as every citizen of India should, should see the police as, as an enforcement agency, not a harassment agency and not an extension of the uh, the politicians and until that kind of thing happens we will be uh, in a gray area between a, a banana republican and, and a truly equitable society. So, so there will be that governance deficit Mr. Murthy. Unless we reform our laws on land and police there will be a governance deficit that will impede India's growth? Oh there is no doubt at all I think uh, given that this country has to create job opportunities for not so well educated and that can only happen by low-tech manufacturing like China has done. Land becomes extremely important if we indeed have to solve the problem of poverty by creating those jobs. Second, of course, police is uh, an extremely uh, important organ of the government to ensure that there is justice, uh, that there is safety in the minds of the citizens, that there is a sense of equity in the minds of the citizens. Uh, so justice, police, land, infrastructure, I think these are extremely important instruments that the government has. And I'm sure once you bring transparency to all these issues, I believe that the, the, the problem in some way will get mitigated.
Well, uh, all of you are familiar with the House of Tata, the emphasis. Uh, the Tata line always is leadership with trust. Uh, Mr. Murthy, I read on your website and I like the line that emphasis says, in God we trust and as you would say, everyone else must come with data. Now, why is trust so important to both of you? Why is trust the center point of your businesses? Mr. Tata first. Um, my view is that trust is an underlying foundation for, uh, for the way people look at you, people look at your business, people look at the way you operate your business. Trust is the basis on which you uh, live by your contractual obligations. And I think trust is more important than anything else. Your psychological bond with your customer and your, your worker and your stakeholders in general. I think without that, you run the risk of, of being a superficial business entrepreneur based on on uh, criteria which are not, in fact, truly fundamental to the manner in which you do business. Because globally, uh, Indians, uh, whether government or businessmen, uh, don't quite have the reputation of being the most ethical, fairly or unfairly. Yeah, I, I don't know whether one can generalize, but I would just say that if you don't have trust in your partner, in your worker, in your management, and vice versa, if there's no trust in the person at the top, either for what he or she stands for or what uh, their value system is, then you have a business that, that supports that level of trust or lack of trust and that goes all the way to, to the consumer. He doesn't trust you for what you provide him. He doesn't believe in your claims. And you have, in fact, a poorer form of, of business. And yet, ethics and values becomes a very major part of it. Mr. Murthy, why is trust important for you? And tell me also, when you, you go around the world, your clients are around, uh, around the world, do you find a trust deficit vis-a-vis -vis India? Does it need convincing people? Well, first of all, let's all remember that trust is the currency that reduces the cost of transactions in a society. Because if there is no trust, then you will have to start resorting to n number of instruments. And eventually, it will always come down to trust. No matter what instruments you use, you will have to trust somebody who implements those instruments. So trust is most important. Second, after all, society contributes uh, customers, society contributes employees, society contributes investors, society elects politicians, society contributes bureaucrats. So if you want to succeed, then you have to create trust with the society. If you don't create trust with the society, then there is no hope for that corporation to grow. Now, on the issue of the trust deficit, I, 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 I think uh, certainly, I, you know, the kind of transactions that we, had in, we have had in India are about the same level uh, as anywhere else. I think it takes, it takes a little bit of uh, determination on the part of both the parties to ensure that there is trust and both the parties will have to work towards making sure that there is trust. And I think wherever this effort has been made, whether it's in India or elsewhere, the transaction is less costly, the transaction is smoother and both the parties are happy. Well, I think we can say that <coughs> if there's been a trust deficit, then the two gentlemen here and their companies have contributed greatly to bridging that around the world. Uh, do I have the vote of the audience on that? So the two of you are doing something right.
we can see. Now, uh, many of you may not know, but many years back, I think about four years back, Indian Express invited uh, India's finest minds to contribute to a series called India Empowered. So they shared with us and our readers uh, their ideas on how to empower India and what an empowered India would mean to them. That was then compiled, compiled in a book published by Penguin. Now I'll quote a line each from what these two wrote in, the, in, 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 in those articles. Mr. Tata wrote, a 10-year economic vision should be announced with measurable goals and which has the buy-in of all political parties. Now, do you think this vision then has to be executed without bending to vested interests or ideologies? Can that be done? A 10-year economic vision should be announced with measurable goals and which has the buy-in of all political parties. I am asking, can that be done without bending, without having to bend before vested interests or ideologies? Uh, personally, I think it can be done. I think it will involve some rising in, in statesmanship on the part of people to rise above their parochial interests and look at a national interest. And I think if, if that is there both on, on the part of politicians and on the part of the business segment, I think it can be done. But Tell us about your experiences, uh, times when you said, I will not bend, or times when you ran into a politician uh, who surprised you uh, in a pleasant way. You know, I wouldn't want to elaborate on this much more, but unfortunately in India, we face a situation quite often where you can't get a group of businessmen in the same room to agree on a common, on a common platform which impinges on A or B or C in some form or another. Overseas, you tend to be able to converge on a common national policy that may hurt or impinge on one and help another, but that gets pushed aside for the national good. I think here we have to rise above uh, that personal parochial interest in favor of what we believe would be a national need. Infrastructure is a good example. Uh, we're woefully behind other, other neighboring countries in infrastructure. Com uh, countries that have been behind us in years gone by and have gone way ahead of us. Infrastructure is, is a real deficit area in this country. And some of it doesn't, does not happen because of vested interests, uh, personal interest groups, uh, something hurts someone, and it stands in the way of national progress. So uh, I believe it can be done if we can rise above our individual needs. Mr. Murthy, the question I asked Mr. Tata was actually drawn from something you wrote in your contribution to India Empowered. You wrote, we in the corporate world have to become men of steel. He produces steel, not you, but everybody has to become men of steel. And then you said, we have to stop crawling when politicians ask us to bend. Will you elaborate on that and maybe speak from experience? Yeah, I think uh, there is a tendency in India to be unduly afraid of the government. Let me give you data again, I believe in data. In uh, 2004, when the Ministry of HRD, based on the advice of a Joint Secretary, unilaterally decided to reduce the tuition fee at IAMs by a whopping 80%, Without consulting the affected party, I stood up to my good friend, Dr. Murli Manor Joshi, a wonderful person, and I told him, I said, this is not the way transactions are done in a civilized society. And he was uh, very kind. We had lots of discussions. 
I would go to his house, have dinner with him, I would convince him by 10.30, he would say, Murthy sahab, jo aap keh rahe hai, wo theek hai. But next day, I would come back to Bangalore in the afternoon and say, Murthy sahab, udar kuch problem hai. Because that joint secretary would have told him something else. Anyway, the point I'm making is at that time, I requested CII to just issue a simple sentence that's in support of what I was saying. All that I was saying was, let there be a dialogue between the IAMs, which are the affected parties, and the government before a decision was taken to reduce it by not by 5%, not by 10%, by 80%. But unfortunately, CIA, was, CIA didn't agree to that. That, in some sense, created a sense of disappointment for me, because I said, these are all wonderful people, extraordinary business people, and I only wish they had said, this is a good cause, this is a worthwhile cause, this is not a favor for Mr. Narayan Murthy, this is not a favor for Infosys, this is something that is good for the country. That's all what I'm saying. That's uh, why well, so I wrote that. Two points come out of what Mr. Murthy said. Uh, one, uh, even he, because he lives in Bangalore, which is another planet, even he got misled into believing that what the minister was doing, which was an awful amount of damage to IIMs, was mainly on the advice of a joint secretary. This is an old Delhi trick for politicians to do things and blame their civil servants, bureaucrats. Uh, but the other thing also is that this particular civil servant, and the names don't matter, that particular civil servant actually is doing quite well now. You know, he's, uh, he's in a very key, key position in the state of Uttar Pradesh uh, and has the reputation of being a clean, sound civil servant. So the question arises, and maybe I turn to Mr. Tata now, can you do all the things that you want India to do without first reforming India's civil service and bureaucracy? Because they have a mindset that we are there to protect what is government of India's. And Everyone else, particularly businessmen, are out to get it. Uh, I think what you paraphrased is, is actually very often the case. And I'm pleased to say we still, have, we still have pockets of our bureaucracy which thrill you because they take a a positive view on what has to be done and stand up for what they believe needs to be done. But very often there is this um, misgiven view that you have some ulterior motive and they are there to protect the interests of, of the Indian citizen. And quite often it is that they are there to protect the interests of, of a few. I, I will not ask each one of you who you vote for. I, I presume both of you vote. But tell me briefly your expectations of, of, of political leadership now, as a citizen and as a businessman. And tell me also, tell us also, of moments when there might be contradiction between the two. Let's start off first. You know, I think most of us would like to see a government that, it's a difficult question to answer because you have a central government and a state government and you have policies and conflicts between the two. And you have different parties between, but if there was, a, assuming there was an alignment, what you'd like to see is a progressive government that is committed to the economic well-being and growth of the country. Uh, and and one that, that truly is concerned about equity of all citizens equal and based on merit. Not superficially so, supposedly in the interest of the poor and in fact not serving that interest at all. Mr. Murthy, you vote I presume? Well, yeah, I do, of course. Uh, I would like to see every political party ensure that 
every child in the country has reasonable access to basic education, basic health care, basic nutrition, and basic shelter. Second, I'd like every political party to ensure that legal and ethical businesses have full opportunity to further their progress because the only way we can solve the problem of poverty is by creating more and more jobs with higher and higher disposable income. So every political party must make sure that all hindrances to legal and ethical businesses is totally removed. These are two important requirements. Is there ever a contradiction between your expectations as a businessman and as a citizen? No, not really. No. I don't see at all. Do you all. agree with that also? There is no contradiction between your expectations of politics as a businessman and as a citizen? Is there ever a contradiction between your expectation of the political system as a businessman and as a citizen? I think there are contradictions uh, at various times. I think uh, there is a, a contradiction between rhetoric, there's a contradiction between uh, public statements, and there's a contradiction in the actual actions. If, if one can uh, oversimplify, you really have a hope or aspirations of seeing India as a country that truly gives equal opportunity to all. We've given everyone the right to vote, but have we given every citizen of India an equal opportunity to, to grow and prosper uh, based on his or her merit? I think we're a long, long way from making that happen. And our policies, government and in industry, have to, in fact, bear this and be much more sensitive to that actual need in reality, not in, not in stated statements. But there's also a great deal of hypocrisy in Indian political, I mean, there's hypocrisy in every political discourse. Every speech of Obama is full of hypocrisy, uh, including his Nobel acceptance speech. But, uh, but in India in particular, uh, our political discourse glorifies poverty, glorifies rural versus urban. Uh, somehow political discourse seems to undermine success, entrepreneurship, uh, becoming prosperous. Isn't it? Yeah, because a promise of prosperity and a protection of the poor enables that uh, aspiration to continue to exist uh, in a certain in a certain boat bank. Uh, it isn't necessarily followed by actual performance, and there is almost a vested interest to keep that disparity as such. Mr. Muthi, you agree with that? There is a uh, there is a glorification of Daridra Narayan, uh, poverty. It is perhaps understandable for several reasons. First of all, let's remember that we were brought up on Harold Laskian socialism because Nehru was a great uh, admirer of Harold Lasky. Second, throughout the world, not just other than the US, even in the UK, in the continental Europe, the 50s and the 60s glorified socialism. We are all brought up on that. Most of our politicians, most of our bureaucrats were brought up on that. And third, somehow we all got into a mindset that said that this country will not make enough progress so that everybody is reasonably uh, 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 reasonably well enough to afford 
basic education, basic health care, basic nutrition, etc. So it's very easy to talk about something that is, easy, that is there around you. It's easy to talk, it's easy to denigrate something that is a very difficult task. I think that's how we have built up this mindset. The day we start making fast progress on an inclusive basis, everybody, all the politicians, all the corporate leaders, all the